Hey everybody, my name is Max and I'm here to talk to you about our work titled From External to Swap Regret 2.0, An Efficient Reduction for Large Action Spaces. This is joint work with these collaborators, Yuval, Kostis, and Noah. And it's also concurrent work with Binghui and Aviad. It's also at this conference, check out their paper too. Now, the main result of this paper is an algorithm for no swap regret online learning with many actions. But what is swap regret? What's online learning? And why are there so many actions? We're going to answer all those questions here today. Stay tuned. Let's start with the basics of online learning. In the setting of online learning, we have some set of actions, and we're going to repeatedly choose an action. So at every single time step, we make some sort of selection, and we receive some sort of reward as well as observing all the rewards that we didn't receive for all the other actions. Our goal is to adapt over time and make good decisions based on the history of rewards that we've seen. Also allowed for in this model is a selection of a distribution over actions, in which case our reward is the expected reward. So formally, every single round, we select some sort of action from the distribution over actions. We then get a reward vector selected adversarially and over capital T rounds of learning, we incur some total reward that is the dot product of these vectors summed over time. Now, there's many different ways to evaluate the performance of an online learning algorithm, but all of these performance measures fall under the umbrella that is regret. I'm going to explain regret in a very general way and then go through specific instances of regret that you might be a little bit more familiar with. But generally, regret is always going to be a comparison between the reward obtained versus some sort of benchmark. Okay, and let me explain what that means. So let's say we completed some online learning task. You know, we selected some actions, received some rewards. And we have this fixed history of what happened, incurred this total reward. What we can consider is a transformation of our actions. So this is a map phi that's going to map our actions x1 to xt to phi of x1 to phi of xt. And then we're going to compute the transformed reward. And regret is always going to be in terms of a comparison between these transformed rewards and the actual reward. What we'll have is it will have a set of maps, capital Phi. And what we want to do is we want our algorithm to have obtained a reward that is comparable to all of the transformed rewards in over all the transformations in capital Phi. So formally what that is, is our regret is going to be the best of all possible transformations in capital Phi of the transformed reward versus the reward we actually obtained. As an example, oh, and so also we will say that our algorithm obtains epsilon regret if this total regret is bounded by epsilon times the total amount of time. Now, a classic form of regret is external regret, wherein our set of transformations is the set of all constant maps. So what that means is we want our algorithm's reward to be comparable to the reward of all fixed actions over time. If we can compete well with all the different fixed actions, we have good external regret. The focus of this paper is going to be a more challenging benchmark. We're going to try to compete against a larger set of rewards, or a larger set of transformations, rather. And that is the transformation set of all possible maps from the actions to the actions, and that's known as swap regret. So, for example, let's say we had some online learning task where we, you know, played these actions A and B. And let's say we actually obtained a pretty good reward on the rounds where we played action A. We're pretty happy with how we did. It's really these rounds where we played action B that we kind of missed out. We wish we could have played something different. So, one possible transformation under swap regret would be a transformation where, indeed, we're mapping the rounds where we played action A to rounds where we played action A. But these rounds where we played action B, where we weren't so happy, we're going to map to a different action, say action C. We'll have to compete against this transformation too if we hope to obtain good swap regret. Right? So this would be represented by this transformation here. Maybe like A gets mapped to A, B gets mapped to C, etc. And this is something strictly, a strictly larger set of transformations than the transformations covered in external regret, right? Because contained within swap regret is also the set of all constant transformations, right? The ones that map all the actions to the same action. It's the ones where every single action gets mapped to a totally different action. This is a much larger set of, of transformations. And we will find that if we can compete well against this much larger set of transformations, we're going to get richer guarantees from our swap regret guarantee. 
Now, as I introduced this problem, I introduced it where every single round you're selecting a distribution over actions. So that would be equivalent in the classical setting of swap regret to considering all linear transformations, you know, a row stochastic matrix from the simplex over actions to the simplex over actions. In this paper, we get something actually even more powerful than that. We actually compete well against all possible transformations from the simplex to itself. Not even continuous, not even, there's, we have no properties about it, just like a full uh, mapping of the simplex to the simplex. Um, we compete against all these transformations, as we will see. So, uh, swap regret. Why would we do this? I mean, you know, it's an inherently stronger benchmark to set for ourselves, but there's, you know, specific things that we obtain. There's a lot of uh, performance measures of interest, like calibration, which fall under the umbrella of swap regret. There's certain guarantees about uh, running a no swap regret algorithm and having uh, robustness against an adversary who knows exactly what algorithm you're running, which doesn't hold for external regret. But I think the best way to motivate swap regret is to consider learning in games. Let me explain. So here's a game, rock, paper, scissors. And let's say our goal is to compute an optimal strategy in this game, which will be known as an equilibrium. So one thing that we can do is we can instantiate a no regret learning algorithm for each player in the game and have them repeatedly choose an action. Right from the person on the left's perspective, the selection of the person on the right corresponds to their utility vector or reward vector. The selection of the person on the left corresponds to the person on the right's reward vector, right? So each of these players is doing a valid online learning task, and they're going to generate over capital T time steps, you know, T different strategies. And we have this guarantee that if we instantiated each of these learners as a external regret learner, then if we have the guarantee that they're, they have epsilon external regret over capital T rounds of learning, then the average of these strategies like x1 to xt and y1 to yt will correspond to an epsilon approximate coarse correlated equilibrium. Whereas if we instantiate these learners with the stronger guarantee of swap regret minimization, their time average strategies will converge to what is known as a epsilon correlated equilibrium. Let me explain that really quickly. In all the various notions of equilibrium in the game, in a game, follow the same kind of format, where it's a strategy profile where no player wants to deviate. And what I mean by deviate is going to vary from game to from from type of equilibrium to type of equilibrium. So what that means is, you know, let's say we have some, you know, set of players in a game, and I'm going to recommend to an action to each of these players. So this is an equilibrium if no player wants to deviate and say, oh, actually, like I'd rather play this action instead. Now a player would want to make a coarse deviation if they're willing to not even listen to my recommendation, no matter what you tell me to do, I'd rather just go with this action, action C, a constant map. Whereas a swap deviation is a, you know, a larger set of deviations. It's the set where they can respond conditionally to the recommendation I give them. So, you know, if, if I, you recommend me to play action A, you know, okay, I'm happy, I'll play action A. But you recommend me to play action B, and it's like, okay, actually, I'd rather, you know, pivot and do something else. Now, uh, the coarse correlated equilibrium is the set of strategy profiles, or it's a, a coarse correlated equilibrium is a strategy profile wherein no player is willing to make a coarse deviation. A correlated equilibrium is a strategy profile where no player wants to make a swap deviation. There's also Nash equilibrium, which is perhaps the most famous form of equilibrium. In this equilibrium, indeed, we also have, we again have the guarantee that no player wants to make a swap deviation. But we have the additional guarantee that the recommendations that I give to the different learners are going to be independent. They're not going to be uh, correlated at all. And this is actually, uh, you know, it's conjectured first off to be uh, not possible to compute Nash equilibrium in polynomial time. And it's really this independence constraint that makes things difficult. Uh, you know, if we're doing a no regret learning task, we're going to be correlated by our shared history of the game. And so, in a sense, correlated equilibrium is this gold standard of polytime computable equilibrium. You know, Nash has this independence constraint, which makes things difficult. And coarse correlated equilibrium is only robust to coarse deviations. But we see it's often the case that the set of coarse deviations is often not particularly desirable. So it's often pretty easy to convince players not to make a coarse deviation. And so it's not clear if it's really a point of stability. Let's consider the traffic game, okay? So at the traffic game, the players are cars at an intersection. And, you know, I have this uh, recommender device, my traffic light. If it says red, it's going to recommend that you stop. If it's yellow, it's going to recommend that you slow down. If it's green, it's going to recommend that you go. 
Now, a potential swap deviation from the recommendations of our traffic light would be, you know, okay, you tell me red, okay, I'll stop. You tell me green, all right, I'll go. When you tell me yellow, actually, I'd rather speed up. I'd rather actually try to, to make it through. Now, you could imagine that perhaps this swap deviation would be, you know, desirable at a traffic light. But on the other hand, the set of course deviations are the set of deviations wherein you have a player arrive at the intersection and say, you know what, rather than even listen to this stoplight, traffic light, I'm just going to cover my eyes and just blast through this intersection, right? So that's the, like, the set of course deviations isn't particularly desirable. You could come to me and say, hey, Max, like, great news. I've set up, uh, you know, this traffic light at your intersection, and there's this really desirable course-correlated equilibrium. So that's, a great, that's great news. And it's like, you know, from my perspective, it's like all you've convinced me is that no player wants to blow through this intersection. You haven't really convinced me that, like, there's no other, like, you know, it's not a rich enough class of deviations. And so the, the notion of equilibrium isn't as rich. Correlated equilibrium is really what we're shooting for, and we need swap regret to do that. So that's all to say swap regret is, a, is an important notion of uh, uh, no regret learning. So why not swap regret? Why is swap regret not particularly common in practice? I think one reason is the following. A classic algorithm for external regret minimization, like multiplicative weights, will, you know, in order to obtain epsilon regret, will require a number of rounds that is logarithmic in the number of actions. Whereas the classic algorithms for swap regret minimization, like blum mansoor are going to require a number of action rounds that is linear in the number of actions. And the problem is, in the world, in the world that we live in, there's, you know, a lot of actions. You know, you can, uh, you can do this, you can do this, you know. There's, there's, there's really an endless number of things that can be done. I mean, you know, learners in modern settings are often tasked with very high dimensional selections of actions, you know, selecting all the parameters of a neural net or an entire policy in RL. And, and you know, these actions are, this set of actions are often exponentially large. And so having this like, you know, polynomial dependence on the number of actions in our convergence rates is going to often be a deal breaker. So back in this 2007 paper, Blum and Mansoor asked, like, you know, is it possible to improve this dependence on n? And we're here to tell you that you can do it. We've solved it, and uh, yeah, so let's talk about our results. We come up with this algorithm tree swap that obtains epsilon swap regret in a number of rounds that is logarithmic in the number of actions, but exponential in the epsilon constant. So again, there's this trade-off, right? If we want an improvement in the number of actions, we're going to need uh, to make a sacrifice in terms of our accuracy parameter epsilon. But again, often in modern settings, you know, we find that the number of actions is going to far exceed our, you know, dependence on this accuracy parameter. We're often going to have, you know, exponentially many actions and, you know, having some sort of like small constant error is going to be sufficient for most tasks. So this is progress in those settings. Um, the algorithm is essentially a general reduction from external to swap regret, meaning that any like regret guarantee that you have in the regime of external regret, you know, something in terms of the Littlestone dimension, which is, I guess, an online analog of the VC dimension, we're going to obtain swap regret guarantees uh, under those uh, measures. Uh, we also uh, make improvements in the setting of bandit, uh, the bandit setting, wherein we don't observe the reward of all the other actions. We improve from quadratic to linear dependence on the number of actions n. And also, we make a lot of progress in the, in the space of computing correlated equilibrium. Uh, there's the models of query and communication complexity, which entail we don't actually get access to the entire uh, game matrix at the start. We actually can only access it by queries to the entries or through like low bit communication between the players in the game. We also come up with the first polytime algorithm to compute correlated equilibrium in extensive form games which was conjectured to not be possible, like, as long as epsilon is a constant. You know, this is a game that's like a tree-like game, and so the number of uh, strategies, a plan for every state is going to be, you know, an exponentially large set. And, you know, previously only extensive form correlated equilibrium, which is a simpler notion of equilibrium than CE, uh, was known to be computable in polytime, even for constant epsilon. So we've made progress there, too. We also have lower bounds. We have an adversary which forces any learner to incur uh, swap regret, at least epsilon, in time either in the regime where n is small, n over epsilon squared, or when n is, is uh, very large, we force the number of rounds to be exponential in 1 over epsilon. Our, our lower bound is also oblivious and has constant Littlestone dimensions, so we have somewhat matching lower bounds there too. We also include another lower bound that gets a slightly better dependence on epsilon, though it's not oblivious. Okay. 
So let me take a moment to discuss some of the algorithms that we use to, or let's, let's talk about tree swap. I'll describe it. Now, if you're familiar with uh, the algorithm of blum mansour you know that there's this key building block where you use an external regret algorithm as a black box within the swap regret regime, as a subroutine. So we're similarly gonna, we are similarly going to need an external regret black box in tree swap, but we have to do a modification to it. So if we have an external regret algorithm like MWU, the first thing we need to do is we need to convert it to lazy MWU. What does that mean? Well, what does MWU do? You know, it selects an action, receives a reward, updates the action, receives a reward, updates the action, receives the reward, etc. Now, lazy MWU, on the other hand, is going to receive and play an action, receive a ward, and then it's going to not update the action. It's going to receive another, another reward, and then it's going to not update the action, receive another reward, etc., over an epoch, until eventually it updates the action that it plays, corresponding to all the rewards that it saw over that epoch where it was being lazy. So formally, what this is, is you know, we're going to take our interval of time from 0 to t, and we're going to break it up into m epochs, or blocks, each of length b. So we could say, you know, t equals b times m. And what we're going to do is, you know, we're just going to play the exact same action over a block. And then we're going to look at all of the reward that we received over that block and use that to update, play that same action, repeat, play the same action for another block, repeat, over and over again. Okay. So why would we do this? It seems a little silly, right? Because, you know, an algorithm like MWU is going to have external regret, converging to zero at a rate of one over square root of t, whereas an algorithm like lazy MWU is gonna get a convergence rate of one over square root of m, right? Only the number of times we update, and we're updating less often. So this seems foolish, why would we do this? The benefit is that over the course of lazy MWU, we played fewer actions. Think about it, you know, we're competing, we're doing swap regret. And under, under the regime of swap regret, we are constrained to if the same actions must be mapped to the same actions, right? And so the point is that for any swap transformation of this history of play, it's also going to be the case that the transformed actions, I guess I'm representing S by, you know, phi of X here, all the transformed actions are going to also be constant over the block, right? If I played the exact same action over a block, then any transformation of that is still going to be the same action over that block. And restricting the set of transformations in this way is going to be a key for the tree swap algorithm. And now I'm ready to describe it. So let's talk about tree swap. Uh, so we're first going to just assume that, you know, t is equal to m to the d for integers m and d. And I want to describe this algorithm. And what it's going to correspond to is a collection of layers, okay? Uh, each layer is going to be its own sort of algorithm. And then at the end of time, we're going to take the average of these layers. Okay, so what's the first layer? The first layer is going to be an instance of lazy multiplicative weights, okay? So uh, what does that entail? It's going to, you know, be one algorithm with m epochs, so it's going to, you know, span, t, uh, you know, t rounds, and each block is going to span t over m rounds. The second layer is going to be m instances of lazy MWU. So that's going to, you know, each of these algorithms is going to span t over m rounds, and each block will be of length t over m squared. The next layer is m squared instances of lazy MWU. So each algorithm is only going to exist for an interval of t over m squared uh, rounds, and each block is only going to last for an interval of t over m cubed rounds, etc. So we go down like a tree all the way to the bottom of the tree where we have, you know, m to the d minus 1 uh, instances of this algorithm. So each algorithm lasts for m rounds, and each uh, block is of length 1. So this isn't even lazy at this point. Okay. So how does the algorithm work? Essentially, at any given point in time, represented by this vertical green line, we're going to ask each layer for the suggested action to play. And we're going to end up playing the average of the recommendations of all of our D layers. Okay? Then, when we receive some reward, UD, UT, we're going to update all of our lazy MWU instances with a 1 over D fraction of this reward. If you're familiar with uh, blum mansour you'll know that the reward we feed into each external black box is going to be scaled down proportionally to how much we listened to the recommendation of that algorithm, and we're doing something similar here. Okay, so what is the swap regret of this crazy algorithm? Essentially, you know, there's some action, x0, that we played over this interval of time. It's going to have to compete against the best fixed action over that interval of time, s0. Similarly, x1 is going to have to compete with the best fixed action over that interval, 
X2 is going to have to compete with the best fixed action over that interval. Similarly, at the layer down, this action is going to have to compete with this fixed action, etc. And etc. going all the way down the tree. So in total, our swap regret is going to be, you know, the sum of all of these swap rewards versus all the rewards we actually obtained. But something is going to telescope very nicely about this, this difference here. Let's look at these two rows specifically. So this is like the swap rewards of the first row versus the you know, actual reward of the second row. If we look at this term right here, you know, this S0 minus you know, the sum of these, these uh, yellow rewards, this is exactly equal to the external regret of that algorithmic instance. Right? External regret is defined as the reward we obtained versus the best fixed action over this interval of time. And so we see that, you know, this fixed action from the above row is exactly the best fixed action over the entire interval of time that this algorithm existed. So this, the difference of these two terms is exactly the external regret of that algorithmic instance. The difference of these two terms is exactly the external regret of that algorithmic instance. And that's the external regret of that one. And that's the external regret of that one at the lower row, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, summing all of this over and doing this telescoping sum, we see that, you know, this is over D minus one of these layers, just the sum of the external regrets of these algorithms that exist at these layers. Now, because it's a telescoping sum, there's one term at the bottom we're going to leave out, okay? And, you know, if you remember how the bottom row works, this is literally going to be the best action at every single time, right? So we can't do much to avoid this obtaining, you know, just a linear, uh, you know, total reward. But the nice thing is, because we scaled down, because we broke up our utility over the D layers, in total, this is only going to leave us with a T over D, uh, you know, penalty to our swap regret. And so essentially, you know, because we had this guarantee that, you know, our, our MWU instances have a 1 over root M convergence to, you know, no external regret, we have D minus 1 layers that are going to be 1 over root M, we have one layer that's going to have a constant regret, but in total, the swap regret of this algorithm is going to be this term right here. And so as long as we have m at least log n over epsilon squared, as long as d is at least 1 over epsilon, then we have this guarantee that tree swap receives epsilon swap regret for t at least m to the d, which is log n over epsilon squared to the 1 over epsilon. And that's the algorithm. I've got a little bit more written up on my website. I wrote a little blog post about some of the intuition behind how we came up with this algorithm. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Other than that, thank you so much for watching. Uh, take care.